Oh my channels. I'm so glad you're still here. I, it's been ages, but I thought, oh, they must have left, but I just had to come back. Um, I went to see a friend and she gave me this book that she found at in a discard box at a school of all places. A book of Robert Frost poetry. <laughs> Isn't that amazing that it was in a discard basket at a school? That's, that's unfortunate. <laughs> but it's fortunate for my friend and fortunate for you and for me because she lent this book to me and I was starting to read the introduction, the foreword to the book of poetry. And it in itself is a work of prose, great prose. It's so beautifully written. And there's so much in it that reminded me of the kinds of conversations we have together. And especially um, right here in the beginning, it, it just reminded me of the mission statement that um, we had to have for Mackenzie Childs. When we first started making this pottery, and it seemed like it was going to be some kind of a company, <laughs> somebody said, you know, you have to have a mission statement. And I thought, a mission statement? Gosh, I'd never heard that, but it was such a grand idea. It sounded like we had a mission. And I thought, yes, we do have a mission. <laughs> so just thinking of having to write a mission statement made me think very, very deeply and very um, specifically about what is our mission in the world. And so I'd start pacing back and forth, back and forth, listening, praying, wondering, what are we about? What are we doing? What are we giving? And all of a sudden, this wonderful phrase, if you will, came to my thought, and it seemed to sum it all up. And it's, it's this, it's, it was the mission statement for Mackenzie Childs um, when, when Richard and I were, were with Mackenzie Childs. And it was, Mackenzie Childs Limited brings homeward compliments home to reveal freedom, jubilance, and purity. And there are two words of operation there to me. Mackenzie Childs brings homeward compliments home. And the word, I had to even look it up, um, because there, there are two words. There's compliment with an I, and there's compliment <laughs> with an E. And the I is, oh, you look lovely today. That's a compliment. And a compliment is something that enters the atmosphere that shines a light on what's already there. It, it enhances, it brings forth. It encourages and, and communicates a, a fuller understanding of what's already there. A, that's what a compliment is. So that's what Mackenzie Childs was. It wasn't the thing. It was simply the thing that complemented what was already there in home, in the sense of home that everybody has naturally. And then the second operative word is reveals, and it's similar, um, to reveal freedom, jubilance, and purity. And I felt like the word reveal was such a precious word because it kind of uncovers, you know, it's like it might have always been there, but maybe buried somehow or hidden somehow, or maybe we just weren't aware of it yet. So it's more of a, a discovery and an uncovering. And um, so those two words really made the mission statement have a mission that we were able to stick to and, and enhance as we grew. So Mackenzie Child Limited brings homeward compliments home to reveal freedom, jubilance, and purity. And right in the beginning of this little booklet where the foreword is, so beautifully written, there was a little pencil, there's a little pencil notation here that says educare, which is the Latin word for education. It means to unfold what is already within. Isn't that a beautiful understanding of education? To unfold what is already within? It's 
beautiful. I just, I think if we had a new idea, if we started out our education, you know, people talk about getting an education, but it's not something you get. It's something that's a catalyst to, to, to unfold what's within. It's, a, it's simply a mechanism for unfolding what's within. It's not the thing. And I just, I love that. And it seemed to fit with our, our um, mission statement too. And then, um, and so it's, it's within this, um, this idea about Robert Frost. It says about Robert Frost, um, he has said that the writing of a poem and the reading of it have this in common. They are both little voyages of discovery. Isn't that wonderful? So this idea of writing a poem and reading a poem, they're mutually important to the poem, to the result of the poem, to the, uh, to the bringing forth of the poem. Just writing a poem and slamming the book, it's only half of the job. The other is finding the poem and reading the poem out to the world and watching it affect your life and others. That's the other half. That's the voy That's also this little voyage of discovery. Both, and I know lots of times people will ask an artist, where, where do you get your ideas? And, 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 and people will say, oh, from a walk in the woods <laughs> or something like that. And then when, when you ask somebody, where did you get this beautiful thing in, in your home? Or, you know, something that you have, when you, when you find something, in a gallery or in a shop or, or uh, anywhere, in a yard sale, whatever it is. Um, you found it, you discovered it, you saw it. And well, I, I found it under a pile of books at a yard sale or something like that. And that's, that's what's so great about it is that the, 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 the person who receives the artistic idea and the person who receives the artistic idea as called the creator, but really they found it, right? They found it through their, their thoughts and their experiences. And the person basically finds it again and interprets it into their own experience. It's, it's so thrilling. It's a two way, it's a full circle. It's a full sphere of contribution that's with, within and about all of us. It's really thrilling. Okay, so here's another little thing that I noticed in this uh, foreword. It says, again, in speaking of Robert Frost, to this fellow who knew him, um, he taught me that growth is a bigger word than progress. Isn't that fa fascinating? I think that's such a great flip-flop because the world wants you to think, well, you know, the progress it's it's about what what line what measure have you what yard line have you got to but the growth is is more important than the progress so just to be progressive isn't enough we have to be full of growth and guess what's the best part about the, the icing on the cake it is that progress is what may men may or may not achieve whilst growth is what is intended for us. It's a given. Growth is a given. Isn't that, it's just, it's such a relief. It's beautiful. We have arrived because we have, it's, it's within, it's there. It's great. <laughs> okay, and then here's another little snippet where it says, <clears throat> a quote from Robert Frost, one of his poems, the utmost reward of daring should be still to dare. I love that. To never be afraid, to never take an, uh, um, an experience from the past and apply it to an experience of now or the future. That we don't have to say, oh gosh, I don't want to do that because once I fell off my bike, I, I better not get back on, you know, that kind of thing or off my horse or whatever. No, get back on and ride them, cowboy. That's what we have to do. We must still dare to go forward. We must still dare. 
when Shackleton put up ads um, for the, the voyage and the discovery of the South Pole, um, he, he put up signs around to, to get people, he needed a crew of men on, on this voyage, and he said, you may come back in a box, but we, we want you if you want it, no matter what. And men, that's what got the men to start to come, to apply. Before he had, actually he rewrote his, his message, and it became a thrilling um, experience for people. They wanted to conquer this. They wanted to overcome something within and, and without in the world. And do you know that that was one of the most grueling experiences any of those men ever, ever had? And in fact, it was a very difficult um, point in history. But every one of those men came back alive from three years of a most difficult expedition. And do you know what the next big calling was? Sign up for the Great World War, World War I. And everyone that was on that voyage, everyone on that crew, signed up for the Great War, for World War I, and served. And they weren't thinking, oh, I've done enough. Oh, I'm worn out. Oh my gosh, I'll, I'll never want to go through anything so hard again. But they didn't, their lives, their personal, physical lives didn't matter so much as their drive to dare. And I just love that. And I, I have another little story about our, our cat. Well, we, we used to go, we used to travel to and fro upstate to work up here at the, at the school um, from the ship um, without the cat. We, we left him there. You know, people leave their cats in a few days worth of food and so forth. But we never brought him with us. But he always welcomed us back with this great scream of delight. He was always just, you know, and he was always so excited to see us. He would run to meet us at the end of the wharf, run, and run beside the, the van, right beside us. But this time, we heard him yelling out, crying out, but there was no Zeno. We couldn't, we could, well, where is he? It was like, he was there somewhere. We pulled up and we realized that the sound was coming from underneath the wharf. The water was so high, it was almost touching the wharf. It had been a big storm. We don't know when. Did you hear me talking about you, Zeno? <laughs> you see, he's here to tell about it. <laughs> Still daring. And he was underneath, weren't you, Zeno? He was underneath the, pl the planks that were holding up the wharf with the water up to his chin, his last breath. And Anton, Frederick's cousin, and both of them were here, he stripped off his trousers and dipped his toe, it just ready to go down, slither down into the freezing cold water of an October um, uh, evening. And just as his toe touched the water, Zeno stopped crying. Why do you think that is? Because he knew all he needed to do was get the attention, to cry out for what the need was, and the need was filled just by seeing this toe in the water. And then he went right down into the water. Zeno fled from this, uh, holding on to this rotting wood. And the two of them floated together and embraced. And up Zeno came like an old wet mop into the towels that we held for him above, above the wharf. And the most important thing about that story is that he continued to dare. People to this day cannot believe that this cat will leap from the ship to the wharf and back and never a moment of hesitation. He doesn't even hesitate. He just knows. And I thought that instinct that there is no past to fear and there is no future to fear. There is no now to fear. And that's what he wrote in his poem, the utmost reward of daring should be still to dare. And then let me just, one last snippet. It's the last page and it brings us right home again. It says, uh, Robert Frost wrote in one of his poems, home is something you do not have to deserve. 
You do not have to deserve home. It's not something you get. It's something you have. Well, now, now we're finished with our visit, and now you can go home. <laughs>